Chapter Eleven of the Expedition of the Donner Party and Its Tragic Fate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. The Expedition of the Donner Party and Its Tragic Fate by Eliza P. Donner Houghton. Chapter Eleven. Watching for the Second Relief Party. Old Navajo. Last food in camp. After the departure of the first relief, we, who were left in the mountains, began to watch and pray for the coming of the second relief, as we had before watched and prayed for the coming of the first. Sixteen-year-old John Baptiste was disappointed and in ill humor when Mr. Tucker and Rhodes insisted that he, being the only able-bodied man in the Donner camp, should stay and cut wood for the enfeebled until the arrival of other rescuers the little half-breed was a sturdy fellow but he was starving too and thought that he should be allowed to save himself after he had had a talk with father however and the first company of refugees had gone he became reconciled to his lot and served us faithfully he would take us little ones up to exercise upon the snow saying that we should learn to keep our feet on the slick frozen surface as well as to wade through slush and loose drifts frequently when at work and lonesome he would call georgia and me up to keep him company and when the weather was frosty he would keep old navajo his long indian blanket and roll her in it from one end and me from the other until we would come together in the middle like the folds of a paper of pins with a face peeping above each fold. Then he would set us upon the stump of the pine tree while he chopped the trunk and boughs for fuel. He told us that he had promised father to stay until we children should be taken from camp, also that his home was to be with our family forever. One of his amusements was to rake the coals to gather nights, then cover them with ashes, and put the large camp kettle over the pile for a drum so that we could spread our hands around it to just get a little warm before going to bed for the time he lived at aunt betsy's tent because solomon hook was snow-blind and demented and at times restless and difficult to control the poor boy some weeks earlier had set out alone to reach the settlement and after an absence of forty-eight hours was found close to camp blind and with his mind unbalanced he like other wanderers in that desolate waste had become bewildered and unconsciously circled back near to the starting point aunt betsy often came to our tent and mother frequently went to hers and they knelt together and asked for strength to bear their burdens once when mother came back she reported to father that she had discovered bear tracks quite close to camp and was solicitous that the beast be secured as its flesh might sustain us until rescued as father grew weaker we children spent more time upon the snow above camp often after his wound was dressed and he fell into a quiet slumber our ever busy thoughtful mother would come to us and sit on the tree trunk sometimes she brought paper and wrote sometimes she sketched the mountains and the tall tree tops which now looked like trees growing up through the snow and often while knitting or sewing she held us spellbound with wondrous tales of Joseph in Egypt and Daniel in the den of lions, of Elijah healing the widow's son, of dear little Samuel who said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth, and of the tender loving master who took young children in his arms and blessed them. With me sitting on her lap and Francis and Georgia at either side, she referred to father's illness and lonely condition and said that when the next relief came, we little ones might be taken to the settlement without either parent but god willing both would follow later who could be braver or tenderer than she as she prepared us to go forth with strangers and live without her while she without medicine without lights would remain and care for our suffering father in hunger and in cold and without her little girls to kiss good morning and good night she taught us how to gain friends among those whom we should meet and what to answer when asked whose children we were often her eyes gazed wistfully to westward where sky and mountains seemed to meet 
and she told us that beyond those snowy peaks lay california our land of food and safety our promised land of happiness where god would care for us oh it was painfully quiet some days in those great mountains and lonesome upon the snow the pines had a whispering homesick murmur and we children had lost all inclination to play the last food which i remember seeing in our camp before the arrival of the second relief was a thin mould of tallow which mother had tried out of the trimmings of the jerked beef brought us by the first relief she had let it harden in a pan and after all other rations had given out she cut daily from it three small white squares for each of us and we nibbled off the four corners very slowly and then around and around the edges of the precious pieces until they became too small for us to hold between our fingers End of chapter 11